Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we're looking at the top 10 decks for the European International Championships 2016 being held in London. Um, basically this is the standard format, this is uh, Primal Clash into Evolutions and we're looking at the top 10 best standard decks going into that tournament based on my own personal opinion in terms of the ranking as well as um, looking at the last four regionals and how all 10 of these decks have been performing. I'll also go over a few rogues toward the end as well, so it's going to be worth sticking around even if you know that Yveltal is likely going to be near the top. So in at number two, uh, 10, sorry, we have Raikou Electrode. This is an archetype that, as you can see, um, it wasn't around in Orlando because it was pre-evolutions and Electrode is a large part of it. Uh, didn't do too well in Fort Wayne or Liverpool, however did make top 8 in Dortmund. I think this deck is the only one in the list that I would question. Uh, maybe this could go in and out as the 10th slot for maybe some of the other rogues that I'll talk about later on in the video. Um, because it has not the best record in terms of recent performances. Just that one top 8, um, it was the only one in top 32 as well. So um, this is really the only deck that you could question in terms of being one of the top contenders right now. But it's definitely a well-placed rogue, so I thought it was worth uh, consideration on this list. So the deck functions quite simply. Uh, you have Max Elixirs as well as Electrode with its Bazap Thunder ability to try and flood the board of lots of lightning energy. So you can continue to use the attackers Raikou and Jolteon EX, whichever is preferable for the matchup. Um, thanks to our typing, we have a very, very favourable Yveltal Garbodor as well as Mega Rayquaza. And we also have a very nice Mega Scizor matchup because of the resistance that Raikou and Jolteon both have, as well as that resistant, um, sorry, the ability from Raikou. Um, it's very awkward for Scizor with its output to actually deal with us. So normally we're trading two hit KOs quite comfortably. Um, and obviously we're an non-EX, they're an EX. That's pretty good for us. Even with their energy discard, they can get rid of their electrodes um, via the attack from the Mega. It still feels very comfortable because we do have Elixir Acceleration and such. So those would be the guaranteed favourable matchups. Jolteon helps out in a couple of awkward ones. Things like Volcanion and Rainbow Road where they're likely going to out hit the Raikus. Um, you just go in with the Jolteon, try and Flash Ray, stall people and make it awkward for them to get the knockout on him. Uh, whilst you're trying to power up Raikus maybe on the bench with things like EXP Share as well. So... The deck is very simple, you're trying to retain and keep as much energy on the board as possible to carry on going with these pretty powerful attackers that just have good typing right now in the current format. So that's why I put them in at number 10 above maybe some of the other decks that you might consider in this list. From here, I feel every other list is very much justified in this top 10. So in at number 9 we have Mega Scizor EX. Mega Scizor is an interesting Mega Evolution. It has that 220 HP, which is kind of nice, a little bit higher than some of the other Megas. So you actually stay out of range from things like um, Gyarados, which is sometimes important. Um, it has the Metal Typing, which is actually pretty handy for Mega Gardevoir EX, which has popped up. As you can see, that's on the list of favorable matchups. Um, it also has the effect of the attack in Iron Crusher that you can discard special energy attach your opponent's active or a stadium card in play. Both of these things would provide awkward situations for things like Rainbow Road, as well as um, Rayquaza doesn't like it too much either. Of course, they can protect their special energies with Magina if they choose to run Magina in their list. So just taking off the Skyfield would mean that sometimes Sizzle is out of one hit KO range, which is pretty handy. Additionally, Sizzle has Psychic Resistance, which is nice um, because Mewtwo was popping up in the definitely in the earlier tournaments like Orlando, Mewtwo was a very popular deck so that does bode well for Scizor and maybe that's why we saw a response in Liverpool where uh, it did start to pick up some play. Um, you can see it sort of had mixed performances, no showings in Orlando or Dortmund however it made top 8 in the other two regionals, two top 8s in Liverpool and uh, one top 8 in Fort Wayne, uh, both times two decks in the top 32. You can think, um, when you're looking at the percentages in this list, um, you can think that roughly 3% is one deck in top 32, just to help you out mentally. Uh, if you're trying to add up how many decks actually made top 32, I figured I'd go with percentages because I think it's a better thing to do than just show one deck in top 32. But if you want to think of it in regards to plain numbers, uh, you can do the same that way as well. 
Uh, the issues for Sizzle really is, of course, it's fire weakness. Volcanion is a very popular archetype, so it's a real risk running the Mega Sizzle. There's a few avenues you can go with Sizzle as well. In Liverpool, the two lists that we saw ran Silent Lab and Red Card. Uh, this is really to try and prevent your opponent playing at all. And it actually gives you a bailout option against Volcanion, where you try and put the lab into play, you go for the red card, and you can Iron Crusher twice and hope that they didn't draw well at all. Um, it's a very niche way of getting around Volcanion or any matchup in general. If people just dead draw off of red card plus lab, it's very awkward for them. So uh, that's pretty cool. And as well, that aspect of ability lock means that you get through Giratinas. So that's very, very awkward. It also stops uh, Fright Knight being a real pain. So um, the ability lock is often seen with Mega Sizzle. Um, that's why you also see Garbodor down there. That's a more traditional build. Uh, having Sizzle with Garb rather than Silent Lab now covers you against Greninja, which is otherwise a very, very grim matchup for the Silent Lab build. Uh, so Garbodor could be a cool option, as well as shutting off those other abilities that I mentioned earlier with the Silent Lab. So Garbodor is an option. Additionally, we saw in Fort Wayne the list that top aided. No, I think it was the list that uh, came top 32. It played Raticate, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to combine Crunch as well as Iron Crusher. Both cards are able to discard energies from the opponent. Um, additionally, I believe it played a couple of Enhanced Hammers and maybe a Flare Grunt as well. You're trying to really just deny your opponent of a lot of their attacks and just hope that Raticate in the late game gets a lot of damage. Obviously, the Ratata is able to get rid of um, um, tools as well. So it provides different awkward situations for the opponent. Obviously, allowing your opponent abilities means that you do get run over by Greninja, as well as obviously Volcanion. You kind of sack those two matchups, but other than that, Sizzle Raticate does seem to have quite a few favorables, so that's interesting to note. A couple of other favorables, uh, Valplume Box, like I was saying. Um, if you're playing Silent Lab, it means you stop their Magina, so Iron Crusher gets rid of those specials, as long as it's not the Regice. Um, Obviously, you can Lysander around that and stuff as well. Um, so I would feel that's very favorable, even more so if you're playing the Eradicate build. And obviously, if you can get a tool onto your Trubbish uh, beforehand, if you're able to go first, I think there's a lot of ways Sizzle can do very well against Valplume Box. And again, I think Giratina builds uh, overall, definitely the Giratina Hammers would be very unfavored against Sizzle. Again, just that discard of the special energy each time is so brutal for them. Um, additionally, you can play things like Pokemon Center Lady is often a staple card in that list, the Sizzle deck. Um, so you can force three hit KOs from the Giratinas or the other sorts of attackers and it's just not going to bode well for them because you uh, take two hit KOs consistently as long as you're playing the Silent Labs or the Garbodor. Uh, obviously you play a Ranger in the Silent Lab build so that you can keep uh, putting Silent Lab into play, so um, obviously under Chaos Wheel. Uh, but just getting rid of those energies is so grim for the Giratina player. So Sizzle does have a handful of decent matchups. And it's also not only made top 32 a couple of times, but it's gone all the way to top 8. So it's a pretty interesting deck to bear in mind. In at number 8, we have Mega Rayquaza. Mega Rayquaza is, again, a very simple deck. Um, you're just trying to fill up your bench and smash really hard with Emerald Break. It does 30 times the amount of your benched Pokemon, so... With Skyfield, you're easily one-hit KOing pretty much anything in your path. A couple of ways you can try and play Rayquaza, both have seen a bit of success. The first place, Liverpool List, chose to run Magina and Metal Energy. Like I was saying, it helps protect against things like Scizor and Jirachi promo with that Mystic Heart ability. Um, or there's the Diancie build that we've seen a bit more in American lists in uh, Fort Wayne. And also the, um, I think there was an ARG special where the Diancie build won. Uh, with Rayquaza. Diancie having the nice Sparkle Veil ability. Uh, when it's in the active, any damage done to your Pokemon by your opponent is reduced by 30. This is a very cool Pokemon for helping out in two key matchups. It's going to be against Giratina decks um, because obviously you are a fairy type and you can one hit KO them quite comfortably, assuming that there will be a stadium in play at any point in the game. Additionally, with that ability and the resistance, it makes Fright Night Uveltol a lot more, or a lot less scary, I should say, for the deck. You're protecting your bench and the active Diancie yourself so that their Pitch Black Spear would not be doing 60-60. It would, in fact, be 30 to the bench and only 10 to the active. So very, very weak stuff and a very cool counter card that a few people have found to play in Rayquaza. It's a decent option indeed.
The favourable matchup straight off the bat would be Mega Gardevoir, because you have again that 220 HP, keeps you out of range even from a Giovanni scheme on top of a full discard of bench, you should be safe. And um, you can obviously one hit carry them in response. Most of the time Guardi is playing Skyfields themselves, so you can assume to have the full bench pretty much all game. And similarly, I would say that Volcanion is fairly favourable. Oftentimes they are not playing Parallel City, they'll be playing maybe Faded Town, maybe Skyfields of their own, maybe Scorched Earth, but I think it's very rare that they'll ever play Parallel City. So most of the time you should be able to reach one hit heroes quite comfortably against them, and as long as you weave in a couple of Hex Maniacs, I would say that Volk is a pretty favourable matchup in my opinion. Uh, you can see the recent performances, just one top cut, or one top 32 in Orlando, Liverpool and Dortmund. Obviously in Liverpool that one list made it all the way, um, and in Fort Wayne two made top 32, so it's not getting in there often, but we've seen in Liverpool at the very least that it can take it all the way in the right meta game. In at number seven we have Vile Plume Box. Plume Box um, is the most awkward deck to play around for almost any player. Uh, the whole impetus of the deck is, we've seen the Jolteon earlier with Raikou, that it covers a lot of different matchups with the Flash Ray. Anything that's a non- or a no evolutions deck is walled by Jolteon quite comfortably. Heavy EX and Mega decks get walled quite comfortably by Regice's Resistance Blizzard. Glaceon EX is there for the evolution decks, and then you're going to combine it with Vile Plume, denying your opponent item cards. So, really you're trying to set up Plume turn 1, if you're able, obviously, and you're trying to get these walls going. This is The walls are the more important thing here, um, because really you don't get Vile Plume up too often on the first turn. I'd say it's no more than 50% in testing, um, so it's not as consistent as previous Vile Plume builds in that regard, but it's not that important to get them turn 1 either, because really the deck kicks off from turn 2 when you start doing your locking aspect, and you really just need Valplume in play to stop them accessing things like VS Seeker or Escape Rope. Those are the two cards that you fear most, really, because they would be able to VS Seeker things like Ranger or Lysander, and um, obviously Escape Rope into Lysander would be able to stop the effect of these attacks, which would really hurt you. The deck plays a couple other Pokemon as well, things like Manaphy for freedom of movement. Obviously, you're running Rainbow Energies in here, as well as DCE, uh, so... The Manaphy helps out in that regard. Oftentimes the deck plays um, Magena EX as well to help you out again from things like Jirachi and Sizzle. Bear in mind Sizzle lists often play Garb or uh, Silent Lab so they can shut it off but uh, at least it forces those sorts of cards and under the item lock it's always a bit more awkward for them. So yeah, it's a very awkward deck to play around. Uh, let's look at the recent performances. Orlando, it made it all the way to second place and um, three were in the top 32, that's 9%. Um, and you can see, obviously, bear in mind that Orlando was pre-evolutions as well, so the format was fairly fresh. People knew from Worlds that Firebox did quite well, uh, so it was on a few people's radars. We've seen it again. Uh, one top 32 in Liverpool, three in Dortmund, and two in Fort Wayne. Um, not making it any further than top 32, but can pretty much fairly consistently getting in that range, so... With the second place of Orlando, you would assume that this deck does have the power to go all the way, uh, running into the right matchups and just being awkward for things. I think this deck has a very strong Yveltal Garbador. Um, the Jolteon hits for weakness as well as walls out the majority of their deck, and combining that with the item lock just makes it even more awkward. Uh, even if they are able to get Garbador down, oftentimes Yveltal players do not play... Um, What's it called? Ranger. Normally their defense against this sort of deck would be Enhanced Hammer, so that's where it comes a bit more awkward. But otherwise that should be a fairly nice matchup for you. Rainbow Road, as long as you're able to get the Jolteon down before they start smashing it in the face, you should be pretty fine. Uh, Mega Guardi, they play things like Horlucha sometimes, but it's very rare for them to do that. And uh, now that there's Dragonite, it's just not much space really. Even if they do play it, it's a one count and under the item lock, it's always more difficult for them to get going, so it's hard for them to overcome Regice. And Mega Rayquaza, again, Regice can wall their entire deck quite comfortably. Um, it's only really something like Jirachi Promo that makes the way into that deck as a non-EX slot um, most of the time, so you should be pretty safe there. So Varpling Box is awkward for a lot of different decks. Not the most consistent. It can struggle over its own self just through clunking, 
putting yourself under item lock and then sometimes missing energy drops is the main way that this deck can lose just by clunking out. Um, but really, its matchups seem pretty solid on paper. In at number six, we have Giratina Garbador variants. I've split these into one deck, kind of cheating, so maybe this is a top 11. Um, because there's a couple of ways you can play this list. Giratina with Darkrai and Elixirs is often um, definitely early on in the season. You can see in Orlando where three of them made the top eight. Those were all Darkrai Giratina builds. And then as the season has progressed, uh, it feels like the McGinn, Lugia, Hammers build, the build that I played in Dortmund, has become a bit more popular um, for different reasons and just how the format has been progressing. So there's a couple of ways you can try and play this deck. Now that we have the Salamance EX promo as well, it may be an impetus for the Elixir Darkrai build to come back into popularity because that Salamance EX is a very, very powerful card and can hit like a truck. So that is pretty uh, tempting for the Darkrai Elixir players, definitely. The real way that the deck functions, if you're playing Darkrai Giratina, you're trying to use double dragons to get going with Chaos Wheel in the matchups where uh, you're against Megas. Things like Mega Rayquaza would really dislike being under Chaos Wheel lock and things like that. Uh, while in the background you're using Elixirs to help get set up further and flood your board of energy. In matchups where it's more awkward to use the Giratina, you just use him on the bench for the Double Dragon to increase the Dark Pulse output from Darkrai. So um, it's pretty nice, just a hard-hitting, pretty safe, consistent deck, really. And you have Garbodor to shut off anything that would be awkward for you. Um, and obviously you don't mind shutting off Renegade Pulse in certain matchups like Greninja and Volcanion. You just try and out-hit them because Garbodor stops their abilities. The introduction of Salamance can improve things like Volcanion, improve things like... Um, obviously, you had a pretty decent Rayquaza anyway, but uh, it seems like one or two Salamance EX sneaking into this deck and maybe trimming the Giratina count down to two or one could be a decent option for this deck to improve a few different matchups. So that's definitely a cool avenue for this deck, and it's already been doing well over the last couple of regionals, so seeing it improve is definitely a reason to consider it a contender for London. And then looking at the Giratina Garbodor Hammers list, um, where you, I think the best way to play it is with two or three Metal Energy with Magina, because having that Mystic Heart is very helpful, protects you from Jirachi promo, as long as you have your abilities online at least, um, as well as Scizor as well. So that can help out, and also having the Metal Energy in the deck means that you can have a much better time against Rainbow Road and um, Mega Gardevoir, which would otherwise be unfavorable in my opinion uh, so yeah I think them again is pretty cool and then just having enhanced hammers flare grunt and uh, a couple of or a few crushing hammer flips it just slows people down enough to make the Giratina a real threat and hope that you can push on and get two and three hit KOs pretty much consistently each turn the Lugia as well just being a single DC attachment to keep you going throughout a game it's just a pretty powerful deck that can clean up quite a few things. I think both lists kind of struggle against um, Yveltal. So that's somewhat of a concern. Because Friday Night is a really awkward Pokemon to deal with. You're very focused on Floatstone because you're playing Garbodor already. Um, obviously if you can't get Garbodor down, then the f well you need to put Garbodor in uh, to get rid of that uh, Fright Night. And... Um, yeah, your numbers aren't great with the Giratina. Definitely the Hammer build struggles against the Fright Knights. If you're playing the Darkrai build, normally they're playing Enhanced Hammers as well. So it's hard for you to get your Dark Pulse map to do enough to deal with them as well. So I would say other than Yveltal, this deck has pretty handy, decent matchups. You can see a few favorables. Mega Guard is favored. I think if you're playing the Metal Energy and the Darkrai build as well can be pretty favored. Um, just because you have Resistance and Fury Belts and things like that, it's awkward for them to keep up with you a lot of the time as long as you keep your Giratinas on the bench don't give them the option to Hex Maniac and clear 4 energy off your board Mega Rayquaza just with Chaos Wheel locking parallel into play uh, is very 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 good for you Rainbow Road I think it's really good if you're playing the Metal Energy if you're playing the Dark Tina uh, it's not great um, but Salamance sometimes can put in a shift because they have to put down a lot of EXs and Plume Box I think because we have Chaos Wheel Flare Grunt is often in the Hammer build at least and Garbodor as well. Um, I never have had a problem playing against Vileplume Box with definitely the Hammer Build is the one that I've tested the most. Um, but I would assume that Dark Tina Garb as well can have a fairly okay time as long as you can establish those Chaos Wheels effectively. 
it can really slow down that deck and make it awkward for them. Looking at the recent performances, three top eights in Orlando with such a high amount in the top 32 at 16%. Again, bear in mind this is pre-evolutions, so although it's still a regionals, it's one that you need to consider a little bit less than the other three. It did make top four, that's the hammer build, and three in top 32. In Dortmund, 13% of the top 32, and they, I believe, were all the hammer builds as well. And in Fort Wayne, uh, two made the top 32. I think it was one of each. One hammer list came in like 10th. And then one Dark Tina Garb as well made top 32. So it's getting up there. It's reaching the high tables. Its biggest concern is probably Yveltal. Other than that, I feel like it can tackle a large portion of the format. In at number five, we have Mega Gardevoir. Again, this is a deck that can go down a couple of avenues. Uh, we've seen recently in Fort Wayne, one of the lists that did well was the side of the left, where you have both Mega Gardevoirs. You have one Brilliant Arrow Mega and or at least one Brilliant Arrow Mega and a couple of Despair Ray ones as well. Use Geomancy and things like Mega Turbo and sometimes even Max Elixir to get lots of energy on the board. So Brilliant Arrow is getting big numbers against things like Greninja where they really don't attack you for three or four turns. That Brilliant Arrow getting consistent one hit KOs is very good for that matchup. Whereas Despair Ray is often two hit KOing, especially because they will sometimes try and incorporate Shadow Stitching and things like N or Ace Trainer to slow you down. Whereas Brilliant Arrow's output is remaining on the board, no matter if they end or Ace Trainer or whatever else. So that's pretty good, as well as just having um, different options with your Mega Guardies. I think Despair Ray is still a big front runner for that sort of deck, but having Geomancy and so much energy acceleration helps you out against, again, hammer builds, which would otherwise not be amazing for you. Um, definitely if they play Metal Energy, it's still very hard, but there we go. Um, and then there's the other build of Guardi, the sort of turbo build where you're just playing Dragonites, Hoopers, Shamans, and you're trying to keep using your abilities set up all the time and just draw lots of cards, try and weave in things like Hex Maniac and Lysander as often as possible. Take advantage of the dual typing that Guardi has. Being a fairy and psychic means that you can one hit KO Hooper thanks to weakness, uh, one hit KO through Giratinas as long as you incorporate Hex Maniac. Um, you have Resistance to Dark, which is very handy as well. Obviously, the dark matchup is still fairly in the balance. Uh, playing one or two Hex Maniac as well as Escape Ropes can help you out because Fright Knight's ability is still an issue, uh, slowing you down quite a bit. Again, Fairy Drop can really make that a favourable matchup, in my opinion. If you play one or two Fairy Drop in your Mega Guardi, I think you should be absolutely fine against the dark builds, in my personal opinion, at least. Um, and just that Despair Ray attack is such a great core to have because you can spam Hooper, spam Shaman clear them off the board so they're no longer easy prizes for the opponent. They have to get through big 210 HP Pokemon, which is not easy for them. You can see in the favorable matchups, I've put Yveltal. That's 100% the case if you do play Fairy Drops. Otherwise, it's still fairly balanced. Um, Raikou Electrode, I would think, is absolutely fine. You can overcome them quite easily without them doing too much in response. Giratina Garbodor, as long as they're not playing Metal Energies, I think it's fairly favored. Um, even without Metal Energies, I found that... Um, just by hitting hammers at the right time and hitting N can be awkward for you. Definitely if you play the Geomancy build, you should be fine against all hammer builds. Um, but if, if it's just the turbo build, they often um, will just try and deny that. So that's sometimes an issue. And I would say Greninja's pretty favoured as well. Again, in my testing, with one or two Fairy Drop, you completely just out-hit them for too long. Um, if you're playing the br uh, Brilliant Arrow builds, I think you get so many one-hit KOs that it's pretty much just too late for them before they get going in the first place. And if you're playing the Turbo build, you're going to get Shadow Stitching a lot, so there's not too much impetus to go Turbo because um, there's so much ability lock right now. I'm almost leaning towards the Brilliant Arrow Xerneas build and being a bit slower inherently, but because there's so much garb anyway, um, there's no real need to have all this speed cards. So, like... I would say the Dragonite Hooper Shaman build is more consistent and more speedy, but that's in a world when Garbodor and Hex aren't as rampant and even Shadow Stitching to an extent. Uh, so I would, if I'm going to London, I would actually lean more towards having one Brilliant Arrow Mega in the list and a couple of Xerneas as well. Uh, having Xerneas in the list also helps you out a little bit against Plume Box. Uh, it gives you an attacker around um, the Regice. Just having one break in the list can really change that matchup as well. So. That would be the one that I'd actually look towards in um, London. That was one of the lists that did well in Fort Wayne. Three of them top 32'd. In Dortmund, just the one. It really, really underperformed. But that's because if you look at Liverpool, 
it came second. It got 22% of top 32. That is an absolutely huge number. Um, it cut very... A lot of people cut with it, including myself. Um, and it was basically... It was targeted too much in Dortmund, I think. A lot of the top players chose not to play it. Because additionally, in Liverpool, as we've already seen, two sizzles made top eight. And that pretty much scared people off in Dortmund from playing it. At least a large amount of people were not playing Mega Guardi. In Orlando, it still made top. Th it made thirteen percent of top thirty-two. That was before uh, Dragonite even came out or Ratata. So the deck is potentially improving, and still we're seeing it do relatively well uh, throughout. And definitely with Yveltal looking well. Obviously, it's not been until this point. It's not in number five. It's so it's even higher on the list. It looks to be well placed, and having a good matchup against that deck is pretty wise, in my opinion, for London. In at number four, we have Greninja. Greninja is a pretty interesting archetype because there's a huge debate right now of how to play this deck. It's ridiculous that we've had four regional championships and we're still seeing ridiculous variation between our Greninja players lists. There are people doing well with this list all the time, but we still haven't nailed the best way to play it. There's a huge debate around whether or not to play Talonflame. Uh, obviously that was the way that it got popular at Worlds because of Aero Blitz giving you a bit more consistency, having a bit more HP in the early game. Sometimes you deny a prize with that regard. Um, but if you don't start with it, it's a lot of dead cards to have in your list. Uh, Jirachi is definitely creeping back into the deck. I think this is out of the three pictures that you see here, the Starmie, the Talonflame and the Jirachi. I think you definitely should be playing Jirachi in your Greninja lists. Just a one-off is fine because you already play one or two Super Odd anyway. Um, so recycling that is really nice for helping out against a bunch of matchups. Things like Rainbow Road, Rayquaza, other things that would just otherwise completely just outpace you. Stardust brings you back into that game, forces them to dig a little bit harder for resources, sometimes have to find Ranger, stuff like that. It's just going to really help you out, I think, in a lot of matchups. It's very, very helpful. And then Starmie as well, the Space Beacon from uh, Evolutions. Still being toyed with with some people. The Starmie does have free retreat. Uh, so that makes it a pretty good lead for the deck. And that ability is pretty nice for guaranteeing water shurikens. Protects you from N and just makes sure that when you do finally get your breaks out, you guarantee yourself giant water shurikens, really. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting option. And you even have star freeze, which can paralyze people. Uh, so that can help out against things like um, the Glaceon decks. Although, of course, you do have bubble as well for paralysis. So plenty of reasons why Starmie is pretty cool. Even the star U... Um, it has free retreat, but it also has an attack for one water energy to do 20. And if you do that onto a Trubbish or a Garbodor, you can then finish them off with one Lysander Moonlight Slash as well. So plenty of reasons why that Starmie line is worth considering right now. So all sorts of Greninja lists are popping up. It's still uh, doing its normal things, going for those duplicates turn two, getting into the uh, stage twos and then into your breaks and just trying to use those abilities to overpower your opponent and free retreat between your dudes and tank hits whenever possible. Uh, the deck hasn't changed since Worlds, really. Um, and uh, basically, it's how to pair it best is really the debate you have to have right now with Greninja. Looking at the matchups, Volcanion is definitely your most favorable. Um, just because not only just... A lot of people say they just beat Volcanion because of weakness. It's not really that. It's the fact that you can stitching, and then they can't one-hit KO through the breaks. Um, so you're doing an 80 damage shadow stitching uh, and then you can finish them off with shurikens quite comfortably you have balloons as well uh, so many reasons why it's a pretty decent matchup for you um, then you have sizzle where they can't one hit again they can't even one hit the regular stage twos often times so that's very good for you even with garbador i feel you have time in that matchup to either deal with the garbador or just get over them anyway with enough retreats and rough seas and whatever else like that uh, there is a debate around the stadium for greninja you can play rough seas you can play um silent lab even to slow people down and additionally an option is faded town to help out against the mega decks so again more question marks for greninja we're seeing lots of different lists do well right now so it's a testament to how good greninja can be it just depends on the meta game you're expecting in terms of how you tech out your deck couple other good matchups. Raikou Electrode I think is pretty favourable. Um, again, that Jirachi randomly does help out because you can stop Electrode and stop their early aggression. And again, Giratina Garbodor. Give them the awkward moment of, do I go into Garbodor to stop Shurikens or do I um, 
allow him abilities so that I prevent myself being stardusted throughout the game. Um, that's going to really help you out. You can see in recent performances, quite a few consistent top 32s. Um, Orlando, Liverpool and Fort Wayne all got three decks in top 32. And in Dortmund, it was very, very popular. 19% of top 32. However, only one top eight so far, and that's Fort Wayne. So clearly Greninja's biggest issue was just hitting too much Garbodor and not being able to deal with it comfortably enough. However, that doesn't stop it consistently making top 32s. So it depends what you're looking for in London. I think if you're looking just to get the big money and to go for top 32, Greninja's one of the safest decks you can pick right now because cross your fingers to not hit like five Garbodor decks and you'll probably get there to be honest because Greninja is very popular. Even a couple of the Garb decks like Tina Garb, uh, you can target just by having Jirachi in the deck. So um, it's definitely not a lost cause for the Greninja. Even we've seen a few more techs, things like Beedrill X is an option. We've seen that. I remember Pablo Meza played it um, in his Greninja list. He didn't do too hot with it, but that's what he played. And there's even promo Greninja to help deal with Garb. So plenty of avenues for Greninja to discuss and uh, test out yourselves. But regardless, in whatever way it comes, uh, it's going to be a top contender in my eyes. On to the top three. Uh, these are pretty good decks, I would say. These are decks right now, even the Greninja, I think. Those top four decks, definitely decks to consider. I think they're consistently top cutting in terms of top 32 and also getting even further into tournaments into top eight and even further than that. So all of these decks are definitely the top contenders right now. I don't think you can really argue with any of these. And <clears throat> Volcanian, <coughs> excuse me. Volcanian is the king of consistency in my eyes. Whenever I test Volcanian, although it doesn't have too many outright favorable matchups, Sizzle is more or less auto win, and Raikou Eels should be pretty easy for you as well, as long as you can get around their Jolteons with things like escape ropes, uh, you should be fine there. However, its unfavorable matchups are never really more than 5 or 10% unfavorable in my eyes. Because the deck is so damn consistent, it will always do what it needs to be done. Um, your power heatering to get lots of energy into play, you're combining that with steam up for early aggression. <coughs> then you're moving into volcanic heat where you can sometimes get one hit KOs whenever Garbodor's not present or whenever you're not being hex maniac. This thing hits like an absolute truck, which is very, very cool for you. Um, it's just a really, really powerful, consistent list, basically. We've nailed it quite nicely in terms of how consistent it can be, just having high counts of elixir. Um, as long as you're not playing Starmie, you have lots of energy retrievals, lots of trainers mails, lots of ultra balls, just high counts of these things. Make Volcanian as simple as possible. Three of the babies, four of the EXs, one Hooper, two Shaman, you're pretty much good to go. However, there are still some tech options you could choose to play. Again, some people have talked about Salamence EX coming into this list. Obviously, you don't have Steam up to power up his attack, but normally just on his own, he can do a really good amount of damage. It's 10 base plus 50 more for each of your opponent's EX Pokemon in play. Uh, so with 3 EX Pokemon in play plus Fury Belt, you're actually hitting 170, which is already starting to get threatening. And then um, if they have 4 in play, obviously you're getting big old 1 hit KOs with Salamance EX. So I can definitely see him becoming a 1 of in the deck to really help out against these things that are playing Garbodor. Things like Yveltal Garb, they normally put in 1 or 2 Yveltals down. They're putting down Shaman. Um, so... Normally that Salamance is still getting the one hit KOs even under ability lock and that's very very cool for you in my opinion. There's also Flareon EX. Um, this is I think the weakest of the techs that I have up here because Flash Fire yes it's a great ability but there's ability lock and if you're playing Volcanion expect to be under ability lock and that being a problem so Flareon doesn't help out that much in my opinion. Definitely my list where it plays three rope, three float, and a ranger anyway. <laughs> it doesn't really matter that Volcanic Heat stops you attacking next turn. You can always find a way out of that in my eyes. So I think Flareon's the weakest of the EXs that you could play, or the techs at least. I would rather put in Salamance, definitely. There's also the Entei, which has Combat Blaze, which is 20 plus 20 more damage for each of your opponent's bench Pokemon. Again, trying to punish people for having high benches. This helps out a lot against Rainbow Road. It also helps out against uh, Rayquaza to an extent. And anything just the sort of overcommits, even just a bench of five is great for you. A bench of four or five means that you can easily, for just two energy, get over the um, Garbodors with the Lysander play. Obviously, you don't need Steam Ups to help you get there. 
so Entei is just a really cool one-off option that I can see sometimes creeping into the list um, to help out for a, d a couple of different matchups for sure. And again, there's the Starmie option. Space Beacon again, just guaranteeing that every single turn you're going to be doing steam ups. As long as you have your ability, you have access to your fire energy basically. Um, basically, the slots that come out are the energy retrievals. You just shove in the 2 2 Starmie line, throw in a couple of dive balls to help search them out, as well as find Volcanium, because he is, of course, part water type. Um, and you've got a fairly consistent deck, and the Starmie can work well. Uh, the only issues being that you are slightly weaker to Parallel City because, of course, Starmie eats up one of your bench slots, so do bear that in mind as well. In terms of recent performances, it made a top 8 in Orlando, with two of them in the top 32. A huge amount in Dortmund and Liverpool, the top 32. That's a really, really high percentage for both. And again, in Fort Wayne, it's a high percentage in the top 32, as well as two of them making top 8. So the deck is just pretty plain and simple, pretty consistent. Even its worst matchups are no worse than like 40%. You can often find it taking ties to decks that you wouldn't expect it to because your opponent just misses a turn of something and Volcano is perfect at punishing slow starts and stuff like that just because it will always do what it has to. It never really misses what it needs to do because that one energy attack gets you going so nicely. Pairing up with elixirs, you just have a lot of energy acceleration, a lot of presence and a lot of raw power as long as you have your abilities online. Volcano is very, very good in my eyes. Definitely worth its slot in the top three. In at number two, we have Rainbow Road. Now, this deck has been top cutting less than Volcanion. However, it's got a first place and two top eights as well. So I think this deck is one of sort of go big or go home decks in my eyes, where this deck, if it runs hot, it will win a tournament because it is just so much raw power, raw pace, and just not very ability focused, so it can't be shut down too much. The biggest issue for the deck is Parallel City. And even then, if you have Galvantula as well as Volcanion, uh, you can still hit 170 with a Fury Belt. So uh, it really doesn't mind. Obviously, it doesn't like Parallel, but even then, you can still hit like an absolute tank. So again, the deck is very simple. Rainbow Force is very reminiscent of Mega Rayquaza, but you're a non-EX. How crazy is that, that you can do such a ridiculous amount of damage all on a non-EX for... A max elixir plus a DC can get you going. Even on turn one, you can be doing this attack, which is absolutely insane. Um, oftentimes, the deck splits off into two ways as well. Um, there's a very heavy non EX build where you have lots of the dual types like Bishop and Galvantula. And then there's a way that you can play it with Hooper, Volcanian, things like Umbreon EX and uh, Genesect DX and Flygon EX, all these sorts of random one ofs, um, so that you can fill your bench of different types. We've even seen. Um, the winner of Dortmund played a bit of a split of these. He played a 2-2 Galvantula, still played the Hooper and a few of the EXs as well. So definitely a few avenues for the Rainbow Road deck to test out. But the core is still there. Fill your bench of different types and smash really with the Xerneas and not much else. Favorable matchups I would say Mega Rayquaza because you both got Skyfield. You're the non-EX. You're just going to win out on prize trade a lot of the time. As long as you can keep hitting things like Max Elixir. Uh, as long as you have things like one EXP share, I think is very good in Rainbow Road if you can find the space uh, to guarantee yourself multiple attackers to keep going throughout the game. That's the biggest issue with Xerneas. If you miss a turn of attachment or if you aren't able to respond KO, the deck can cause snowball out of control. As long as you have a turn or two where you can KO, uh, tank a hit with things like Fury Belt, we go up to 160 HP. We have resistance to dark, so there's a lot of reasons why this deck can do well. Um, and sometimes tank hits, it's just whether or not it can really sustain enough throughout the game. It's rare for this deck to set up more than three Xerneases just because of the resources it takes. You need to keep finding DC, you need to keep finding fair energies, hitting elixirs, stuff like that. That's the biggest Achilles heel for the deck in my eyes, how consistently you can get attackers going. But more or less, if you just have enough of that raw power and output, sometimes it can be unanswered. And if Xerneas is unanswered, it just goes ahead and takes two prizes every single turn and wins, you know, very, very quickly, capitalizes on that pressure. The deck also has a very, very good Greninja matchup. If you're playing the Galvantula, it's amazing because you get that Joltic down turn one, you go into Galvantula turn two, and you can double thread to KO two Frokies before they come out, which is absolutely awesome. Even if they're going into Frogadiers and stuff like that, the double thread is still worth going for in my eyes. Um... Oftentimes you're getting these snipe KOs quite effectively. 
obviously if they put rough seas down then it's a different story but if you go for two if you go for like two frogadiers they rough seas up and you can still snipe them again so uh, i think the galvantula is a very very cool play to help out against greninja it also means that you can start elixiring to Xerneas is on the bench and you can keep DCEs in hand so that you're not so worried about the Jirachi until later on in the game when you feel you have enough resources. So I think the 2-2 Galvantula line, we saw it win Dortmund with that sort of list and I think that's a great one to carry on with going forward. Additionally, I've mentioned Parallel City and if people are trying to parallel your side of the board, it means that oftentimes they haven't cleared off Hoopers and Shamans. So again, Galvantula becomes very cool because you can sometimes target Shamans to maybe set up a four prize turn with a couple of Galvantula snipes. So the deck can attack on multiple fronts. It's very cool. Um, recent performances, only a couple of top eights in Orlando. A top, uh, sorry, a couple decks in the top 32 in Orlando. One top eight in Liverpool with only a few in the top 32. Again, not very many in Dortmund, but one of them going all the way, taking the win. And in Fort Wayne, one top eight as well. And a lot more of them in top 32. So maybe the deck's rising in popularity. Uh, as we saw it win in Dortmund, maybe it got a bit more popularity, a bit more hype as we saw how the list was able to function and do so well. So again, Rainbow Road, not as consistent as Volcanian or Greninja in terms of getting into the top 32. But once it there, once it is there, it goes deep because it's just um, just a very powerful deck and difficult to deal with. A lot of raw aggression and sometimes that just wins games. And then in at number one, this comes to no surprise, I'm sure. Uh, you've told Garbodor. It's a very simple deck as well. Um, all you're trying to do is out-hit people a lot of the time. Uh, Garbodor means you're not worried about Volcanion or Greninja out-hitting you. And um, everything else that doesn't need abilities. Things like um, Rainbow Road and Rayquaza. Those are the only things left that really out-hit you. Uh, you have Fright Knight to slow down Rayquaza. Again, Fright Knight really hurts uh, Rainbow Road because they're normally playing things like two floatstone and one switch that's pretty much all they play um so you can stall them out and start sniping pitchback spear is a very very good attack in this format where you can target down shamans for easy prizes or set up multiple pokemon around the board to get into range of the ex's attack evil ball still a very good attack in this format and y cyclone again you have acceleration from elixirs you have energy retention from y cyclone there's a lot of reasons why uveltal is very good Normally it takes two or three turns to set up KOs with things like Fright Knight and White Cyclone. You normally go down in prizes, but you have a good board state with a lot of energy on it. You hit them with an N, you try and then start to take control of the game uh, from there and really just dominate because you have the better board state, hopefully, if they don't draw well off of Ns. It's kind of a slower deck. We saw um, in, Liverpool, in uh, Dortmund, sorry, the second place list was very wacky. It just played four EXs and was very focused on ace trainer and then you can see the late game and all you're trying to do is keep energy on board with that y cyclone throughout the game build up a big evil ball in the late game hit them with an n or an ace trainer and see if they have an answer to a one or like a fully healed yveltal that's able to one hit kill everything so um very cool options for the garbador deck um just denying abilities as well combining that with n gives people less outs they can't ultra ball shame and stuff like that uh, so it's just a consistent deck that does what it needs to do as well. That Fright Knight ability is really good in the format as well. You do have the debate of when it's important to put in Garbodor and when not to, uh, because Fright Knight is still really awkward for the Mega decks. That HP as well is really awkward for Scizor, so there's a few different very favourable matchups. I put the Yveltal Break up in the top right corner as well. This is something that we've seen in a couple of the Dortmund lists. Don't think it was too popular in the American lists, but... Uh, having the one of Yveltal break means that you um, no longer get shut off by Silent Lab. Obviously, I think this is a reaction to the Liverpool lists where we saw t Silent Labs in the uh, Sizzle. So maybe that's why we saw them in Dortmund, uh, because then Fright Night still is a pain for the Sizzle deck, and that's very good for you. You also have the attack Baleful Knight, uh, which can snipe um, and pretty much auto win your um, Gyarados matchup. So maybe it's worth a slot there. Additionally, it means that you can uh, tank a hit from a Jolteon and actually hit them back sometimes uh, with Baleful Knight or even with Pitchback Spear because you are technically no longer a basic Pokemon. Uh, so there's a few reasons why you might consider the one-off Yveltal break uh, in your list as well. So a few things to consider there. But normally, uh, the deck is very simple. 
Ultra Balls, VS Seekers, Elixirs. Only a few Trainers Mails. Normally, the deck doesn't have space for three or four, which is surprising. Uh, you're playing Gardles, Floats. Uh, one or two E Hammer is often a staple. A high physical support account. Um, three or four N is typically the case. So, those are things to watch out for. But um, yeah, the performances speak for itself and why I have, I've had to put it at the top slot. A first base in Orlando to kick things off. Uh, lots of them in the top 32 of Liverpool. Lots of them in the top 32 in Dortmund. And five of them in the top eight. That's an absolutely absurd number. And it was a Yveltal mirror match in the final of Fort Wayne as well. Again, with a very impressive top 32 showing. So Yveltal's making strides, hoping to be the top contender right now in the format. And uh, that's why I put it in at our first spot. The favourable matchups would be Giratina builds for sure because they have to commit so much energy to their board, it makes Evil Ball very nice for you. You're not being denied too many things. Losing DCE uh, is sometimes an issue, but normally you can just out-hit them regardless, and you do play enhanced hammers of your own to slow them down and slow down their output as well. Volcanion, I think, is only slightly favourable, but it is favoured just because uh, Fright Knight can slow them down, it can shut off float stones in the early game, make it awkward for them, and then you can go into your Garbodor later on slap those ends down, go for big evil balls and wise cyclones, and it's just awkward in my eyes. And Greninja, again, I think it's slightly favoured for Yveltal. Uh, the high rough seas count is the biggest issue for the Yveltal player, but normally just early pressure, hit those elixirs, get those evil balls going, and um, you normally run through a large portion of Greninja's before they even have a response on you, and Garbodor's going to stop their abilities anyway, so normally that seems pretty favourable in my eyes. So... There we go, Yveltal Garb in at number one of our top 10 list. However, there's still a few more considerations for London. Don't fret if your deck that you're playing wasn't picked. Maybe it's on this page here if you're going rogue. Mega Mewtwo Garb did well very early on in Orlando, but I think the weakness to Psychic is an issue because um, there is, of course, uh, Mega Gardevoir EX, which is part Psychic. Additionally, it's not great against the Dark decks because of Fright Night and things like that, so... Couple of issues for Mewtwo right now, but otherwise it's pretty solid. You could also choose to go uh, Rogue with Gyarados. Uh, that full retaliation still does a huge amount of output, and if people don't have counters to Gyarados, or if not many Giratinas show up on the day, it could be a very good play. Zygar Carbink managed to make top 8 recently in uh, Fort Wayne. Additionally, it's done fairly well in the UK. A few players have been playing it. Um, so that's an option for you, just having a high amount of HP and early pressure is sometimes enough to overcome different decks. Do of course bear in mind that it's not the best against Yveltal, a lot of other matchups are fairly favourable for the deck though. We've also seen Pidgeot Jolteon Garb almost won our hearts in uh, Fort Wayne, it bubbled at ninth, unfortunately. Um, but that's a deck that you might have to be on the lookout for, additionally McGinn of Pidgeot, um, those sorts of builds, even again with Garbodor. Um, that's another avenue for the deck to go down. It does gain the McGinn and Noni X promo, which can actually help out against one of the harder matchups, things like Rainbow Road, where they're able to otherwise oh hit KO the Pidgeot, or at least wait till they have the chance to, so they're never too worried about Mirror Move. Um, having that promo could be an option for you. Um, then there's also Regice Glaceon Garbodor Hammers, a very, very rude deck that no one likes to play against. Um, again, it's almost like Plume Box in that it tries to stop a large portion of the format from attacking you in the first place. However, this time you're combining it with Garb and Hammers to really just deny people ever attacking at all. Very awkward deck to play around. I don't expect many people to pilot the deck, but I could still see it going quite far. I think it's a very good archetype, and I will be profiling that soon. And then Stage 1s as well. It's gained a bit of hype just because really you could play Zeb Striker or Raichu which gives you a freebie basically against um, Yveltal. And then you've got Vespiquen for um, Greninja and other things, just late game B revenge basically. And also there's the option of Zoroark. You can even play Zoroark Break, um, which then helps you out a lot against Giratina builds, which otherwise this deck would very much struggle with. And then Mindjack as well, just being a good threatening, damaging attack and stand in as well. Just very decent stage one Pokemon, all attacking for just DCE. Um, pretty consistent. As long as you can get that list consistent, it's um, definitely a threat just by doing the good old things of hitting for weakness right now because obviously um, there's a few common weaknesses in the format, so 
that again could be an interesting pick for London. So that's where I'm going to leave you guys. Hope you have a really good time in London. Uh, I'm just going just gonna to throw out one more list for you. Um, well, th this is the only list really, but uh, this is one that I was testing on stream the other day and I thought it was not much fun to play. Definitely not any fun to play against and it would be awful for me to stream. So if you want to ruin my day, make me commentate some Warlord matchups. Um, I actually think this is a well-placed deck right now. I don't think it loses to many things flat out. Um, it's awkward to play against for pretty much every deck. So um, if you w really want to go outside the box, I know I showed some rogues on the last page, but this would be really bonkers to see you bring this and do well with it. I'd love to see it. Let me know down below if anyone is going to rep well, Lord, and uh, what they think of it in the first place. Have I gone too crazy here, or am I just uh, waiting for memes to happen and not really thinking about this deck fully? But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this top 10 list. It took a bit of time to put together all the stats and stuff, so I really do hope you enjoyed it. Put your comments down below. What would your top 10 be? Maybe there's a rogue that I've not even considered yet. Uh, maybe there's a deck that you're repping in London. Come and say hi to me in London. It's going to be great fun. I'm, of course, commentating, um, so I'll be suited and booted. But I will be wandering around the tables as well as stuff like that. So hopefully it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be the biggest European tournament ever, I would imagine. Hoping to hit something like 450 plus players. That would be excellent. So a lot of exciting times. It's less than a week away now. So I hope you've got some testing in. Maybe this list help you out. Um, spurs on your testing if you've not chosen a deck as well maybe this deck maybe this uh discussion has helped you out also so thanks a lot guys for watching uh subscribe to the channel if you have not already and please leave a like to this video it does help me out a lot and uh for now it has been joe from omnipoke and i will see you guys next time